Cameron has so many points of inspiration for higher ed, literally in the buildings themselves, but also the use of the network for scalability, the, um, the globalness of the learning between the students, their ability to get that across. It would be very hard to produce those kinds of results if you were dealing with students in one city, in one school, in one population. And it's very hard to say that what they're doing isn't mastery. Um, and yet, at the same time, they're not getting uh, they're not getting credit in many cases for it. Yeah. And, and I would also, I would share the story about your, your um, community service requirement. Oh, yeah. So uh, I'll do two stories because it's kind of interesting. One is, uh, in order, I, I was trained in the UK, and what's interesting about the UK is there's a marriage between academic and vocational training of the architect. So you do kind of your undergraduate, then you do a year of work experience, then you do your graduate, and then you do a year of work experience, and then you're an architect, and you can build buildings. In this country, it's the reverse. It's like you do your undergraduate, you do your master's, you do an internship for three to five years with very specific requirements, and then you get licensed. So, and this is a kind of convoluted system that's been developed over the generations. Um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, points of the accreditation of an architect is service learning, and that you have to do 80 hours of service learning credits in order to become licensed. I run the largest pro bono design organization in the world, and as the owner of the organization, the credits that I, I account, accrue, don't count because I own the company, right? So I have to actually go and work for another nonprofit design organization in order to get my accreditation points to show that I have done pro bono or uh, um, you know, social focused work. So it's this kind of, I have to basically go to my competitor and say, hey, can I intern in your office for two weeks? And now I can become licensed. So like, there's some accreditation issues. And then I think the second point I wanted to make was, I mentioned earlier, is we have so many students. I think we must have about 100 to 150 resumes and emails a week from students saying, I want to get out of whatever I'm in, and I want to do what you're doing. And most of the education work we've done, I've taught at MSU in Montana, and I've taught in Minnesota, uh, and I've taught at, at USC, um, they've happened because the students have rebelled. And they said, we're either leaving the college or you're bringing someone in who will teach this. And what we did this uh, uh, um, semester is we said, if you can organize a, a, a shadow studio in your university, we will teach it. And within two weeks, six universities, um, uh, Berkeley, Hawaii, San Diego, uh, Auckland, Adelaide, uh, Sydney, and actually now Hong Kong. We have, uh, an, and we have a community college on the Solomon Islands that want to help after the tsunami, have all worked together and are all working together on issues around the Pacific Rim that affect all of them. So whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, rise, you know, the, the, the risk of earthquakes, um, whether it's uh, waste, uh, whether it's migrant labor, so we're doing the person who talked about housing for, I mean, schools for uh, farm workers, that's one of the projects we're doing. And so the curriculum was suggested by the students, the students are all doing it, and there's one or two adjuncts that know about it, but none of the deans know that this is going on. We have 200 students doing this without any credit, they just want to make a difference. I think that it's stories like this that I think really provoke the kind of conversation we're having here and really force us to say, does that count as mastery? Does that count as learning? Does that count as something that's valuable? And how do we start to take advantage of that? Because that would not have happened without the technology and the delivery of the platform that they built. It strikes me that the major challenge that you pose to those of us in education, our entire system, I think, is built on scarcity. That we are collecting scarce resources and putting them in a place so people can come and get them. And the, the, the fact of the matter is that scarcity has been obliterated. Architects were screened because they wanted to control the number of people in the profession. You've turned that upside down because you can. And so if content and access to knowledge and access to experiences are freely available and ubiquitous and global, the real question is what's a special service that educators provide that can't be done by anybody else? Mm -hmm. To go, I think, to the heart of it. I think there's some I have some answers to my own question, but I'd be interested in what you both think about 
what, how do you handle abundance with organizations that are economically and historically organized around scarcity and winnowing and keeping people out as well as helping people in? Some of the answer to that question is going to come from various people, and I think that's a great question for us to keep in mind because once you open up networks, you will see specialization happen. You will see a different kind of curation happen. You'll see the role. Cameron brought up the role of place, like place is important. Mm -hmm. So you, you, don't, you can't get rid of those notions. I think the other thing is, you know, how does the world value something that is not a traditional degree? I mean, I think that, that you know, Kaplan and Phoenix and others have, have sort of worked through that now. And, and then if we push the idea of degree or learning in some other direction, then I think there will be some catch-up period for employers and others who, who are, you know, driving those numbers. I mean, those numbers, uh, the difference in um, salaries, for instance, and unemployment between those with a degree and those without are certainly not completely based on the fact that all the people who got a degree learned twice as much as those without. It's a matter of how that's valued. And then, so I think that's part of what, I mean, that's part of the competitive advantage today of a, uh, of a of university. Now, the question is, will that remain a competitive advantage, or will there be alternative uh, certifications, degrees, things that, that certify learning in a different way that then begin to compete with you uh, in, in new ways? So there's a concept that we're going to talk a, a little bit about that we look at it as unbundling. Those of us in other industries who've been through this, whether it's financial services or healthcare, real estate, I mean, many other industries who have uh, embraced technology start to unbundle things and they find different value in different pieces and recombine and coordinate them differently. Higher education hasn't done that yet. Everything is still quite bundled together and it's, gonna, it's going to go through a transformation that we think is interesting and challenging. I would, I would encourage anybody else in the audience who's been through that, particularly in the business side, um, if you want to address it, it, it's worth addressing as well. But this isn't just for questions for, you know, they're, they're, the room, as you can tell, is full of wise people. So. Well, I, th I think for us, it's not a, it, it, it's a different uh, thought about scarcity because in architecture, you've got 70% of the world's architects being taught in a place where there's 30% of the work. So it's not a kind of like either or, it's an and. And what we found is that on a, on a career that is part vocational, part science, and part creative, you need to rethink the way that you educate your students. So, you know, why should the University of Kentucky or RISD have a, you know, a department of humanitarian design when they can essentially outsource to us, right? We'll take your students, we'll train them in a specific uh, direction, and it might only be 1% of your students who want to do this, that's fine. And then they go back into, the, into the, the kind of hallowed halls of the university, and they get the broad holistic education that you need to become an architect. Because basically, like, you know, it's, it's really great to get in, in, involved in social issues, but the, the whole building not collapsing, not killing part is really important, <laughs> right? And so, like, <laughs> You guys are the experts at that. And like the advancement of the not falling down, killing people is what you guys do best in our industry. So. Yeah, I'm Steve Lowe, I'm Um The hybrid learning experience environment. Um, fascinating, and I think it touches on what both of you are doing. Last month, I visited one of our sites where our uh, skilled transition professionals are teaching in Watts, in Los Angeles. Um, Lock High School, which is operated by Green Dot Charter Schools. It was a little over a mile or so from the airport, from LAX. Coming in through LAX, um, there were a number of vacant brand new buildings, many of which were probably leaning toward becoming green buildings, uh, if not green buildings. Uh, it was not far, Lock High School is not far from the USC campus. To get into Lock High School, there were bob wired um, iron gates that had to be pulled apart, almost like gates in, um, dare I say, uh, camps of um, prison camps. Um, and so the gate was pulled apart 
for us to get in. And Lock High School has been improved uh, it, since its early days. This is where most of the students in that community are educated. And it struck me after an hour and a half of being enormously depressed by the environment in which these students were learning and, and which some of our teachers were, were teaching that there is a gap here between the cities which are giving green lights to green buildings, um, which are tolerating um, vacant condos uh, in many of the cities. There's an article in American Prospect this, this month precisely about this. And the colleges which are surrounding some of these high schools, when we are really looking toward the same goal, um, if we want to bring these students from these high schools into colleges, why not put them onto a campus setting? Why not put them, give them a taste of what college life is like? Why not put them into an office building um, and convert some of the unused office space to classroom space so that we can fill part of the need of the 10 million classrooms um, that we have, particularly in green buildings? But instead, what we do is we pull the gates of Lock High School at night. We lock the students down during the day. We, we have these remarkable professionals, one of whom worked for 30 years for Chevron in the business department, and she's teaching math to students right out of juvenile detention. Uh, what is it that is preventing us from going into these hybrid learning environments that would improve the cities and improve education both at the secondary and the post-secondary level? So we've got we've got only a couple more minutes for questions, so I, I'd really like to make sure if anybody else wants to age we can cover it but I, I would say on that one one of the things we've, we've been looking at with Lumina is how do you use spaces differently and I know Cameron you mentioned that 24-hour um, yeah. buildings and I know Carol you've talked a lot about underutilized spaces in cities well and a lot of that is going on right I mean there there's a lot of charter school use of uh, underused office buildings etc I mean you're seeing a lot of that take place now one of one of the uh, designs that came in and that was what was inter interesting is we haven't done a full kind of post, we call them post-occupancy analysis because we build buildings, so I don't know what the correct terminology is, but we haven't kind of gone back and kind of done the surgery on what happened post the competition, and it only was September. Um, but I understand that the, a design team from Indianapolis that worked with a school that was in an old warehouse is going to, you know, they, I, I love it when they get stubborn because they're like, we should have won. You guys are idiots. We're going to build this anyway, and we're going to improve the kids' lives, whether you like it or not. And we're kind of like, okay then, right? And, and, and so what we found is that, you know, when you have these great ideas and you, you do have people that are involved in it, they get kind of, they rally behind this. So I know Indianapolis, that team, uh, is really working on, the, on that school. Uh, the other thing I kind of want to mention is like, you know, People design to the textbook, and when the textbook for building schools is written incorrectly, we will build you a prison, and then that will be the feeder system into the prison system of California, which, by the way, is funded more than the education system of California. So, you know, what would you rather do? Um, you know, when you, yeah, I, I just visited all these brand new colleges, these hybrid colleges in the UK, which, um, and I was stunned by them because they were tearing down the school. It was rather symbolic. They built the college next to the original school, kind of like what they do with Yankee Stadium or Giant Stadium. And they tear down the old school afterwards as a kind of symbolic gesture to the community of like the kids are in this brand new kind of hybrid learning environment that, 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 that parents use as uh, 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 gathering spaces in the evening. It's where the community meetings are. It's where there's a health clinic. So voila, you've got healthcare in your school because it's a health clinic as well. And then they can look outside and see this god awful you know, comprehensive school get torn down. And so it's kind of a signal to the community. So it's not just about retrofitting these buildings and creating these hybrid spaces, but it's actually kind of like watching the funeral of the bad building. So, you know, there's some guilty pleasure in that. But I, I, I felt bad when they took down Shea Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> that may have something to do with how well the Mets did. I'm Andy Kamenetz. I have an annoying question for Carol. Um, you said that uh, income was, uh, the, the, sorry, education is the biggest cause of increase in income. Is it more true to say that it's, a, it's most highly correlated with, with uh, income? Are there other factors that you're isolating out and just looking at education? Uh, well, I think what I said was that uh, if you, educational attainment is the, is the biggest explanation of success of cities as 
measured by per capita income. So in other words, if you, if you look at cities, 58% of their success can be, in terms of per capita income, can be foretold by the percentage of college graduates in their population. It's a good question. Jim? The, building on the scarcity point that was made originally, it seems to me as we think about where are the opportunities to invade the established higher ed system with the kind of platforms and networks that you're talking about. There are areas where there is such demand uh, that it is impossible for the institutions as traditionally conceptualized. I mean, I, I think of Michigan State's work with the Global Food Safety Network. There is a massive global need for open source, standardized, competency-based work with, in terms of food safety and security around the world. Nobody, I mean, that, that's, that's crucial, obviously. You know, we don't want to be poisoned either. We don't want buildings to fall on top of us, and we don't want to be poisoned. There's no way that that can be handled in any other way than in an open source network piece. Public health is another area, obviously a massive issue. We have millions of public health people in the world who have no public health training. They are very smart doctors and nurses and people who operate sick clinics, but they wouldn't know what to do with the public health crisis if it fell on top of them. Right. So there's this massive need for public health certifications. So I'm thinking there are areas where, although we are built on this, this model of winnowing and safety, I think, in the traditional environment, maybe if we can think about areas like that where it's, it's almost the only way we can meet the very public need uh, is, is through this kind of an approach that you've outlined here. I just want to answer that very quickly. There's a good, I always use the medical profession and the building profession as in harmony because I know that certainly I work in the developing world. There was a series of books in the 70s that were produced called The Where There Is No Doctor, right? It's just like if, you're, if your kid has a high prob probability of dying, you're going to read that book and make sure that whatever the, the basic steps are to, to, to give them the highest chance of survival, you're going to do, right? So there should be a where there is no architect or where there is no builder because when you have like the Sichuan earthquake or you have a disaster like in Burma, I mean, what was amazing is we were working in Burma before anyone else because we had a network in Burma we didn't know about and they activated, almost kind of like Al-Qaeda for good. And they, um, they had all the resources to um, all the work that had been done in flood-prone uh, areas, including the Gulf Coast, and looking at the peer mechanisms developed under the CC licenses, and say, we can just take this, reuse this in bamboo, and implement it, and start building our community. So it's that kind of like, the, whilst there is, uh, there's immediate needs, where it helps in the university system is that we need peer review, we need people that are pushing the, the, the boundaries of construction and architecture, and we will always have the, you know, Frank Geary's and the, uh, um, and the Norman Foster's and the Zaha Hadid's of the world. We need them, but that's for 5% of the world. What do you call them? The star architects. The star architects. Star architects. <laughs> Just can you expand a little bit about this? Because the question, the first question was, in some ways, um, here's a, a, a traditional issue has been in an open source and open systems, there are lots of good ideas and lots of bad ideas. And just as you point to the architecture school as the way of learning how not to have buildings fall down, you're in a system where there are lots of people who are contributing and lots of good ideas being put forth, but also probably lots of bad ideas. So how do you help screen those ideas out that people will pick up that would be harmful, and how to point to those ideas that actually would work and not fall down? Because now you're in an intermediary where you're getting all this flood of wonderful stuff and all this flood, probably, of crappy stuff. Yeah. So how do you think about the crappy stuff and point toward the good stuff? Well, uh, the Gulf Coast is a good example because there was a lot of crappy stuff built after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and, and not because it wasn't beautiful, it's because it wasn't thinking about the Gulf Coast in 20 years. It was thinking about, you know, what do we do before the next election cycle? Part of that is to uh, not only embrace and honor those buildings, but it's always about the money. So you fund them. So if we have a pool of funding and we will build your building, I mean, that's the basic you know, you have a million ideas, but to implement them is really the solution. So, you know, you need funding for it, and we have a funding pool, we will fund your building and it will, we will get it built. Because what we found is when you build a solution, you suddenly uh, change everybody's perception of whether this is a good idea or not. Because if you can put your hand on the handle of the front door, you're like, I'm in. Like, the, the mo if you go down to Biloxi and you see the houses that we funded, um, 
you'll, you'll see the impact it's made in the area because all the details but are how stolen. how did you choose which ones to build? I think Elliot's question is maybe you probably got 1,000 ideas. A lot of them were not really workable. With, with that particular solution, um, the homeowners, the families, chose the architects and the ideas they wanted. The architects then had to work with the families to reiterate that design solution based on the specific needs of the family because not only are we trying to push innovative ideas, we're, supposed, we're also trying to solve a, a whole housing equity issue. So, you know, that's very specific. But as, of, as a result of that, the contract, the social contract between the, the end user, the architect, and us is that all of it has to be but in the open. But did some of your designs system. come from non-architects? Yeah. And did you pair them with architects or licensed. find a way to figure out the quality? Always licensed. Always licensed. Increase the quality. Yeah, we've never done a building without a licensed professional. But if I go to the site and I see open source designs there, and I say, yes, that works for me, it's not a question of your funding or your certification of that. How should I tell people you can go there and feel safe about downloading that open source building it yourself, finding your own, your own funding, finding your own people to build it. How do, is there, is there some need? Well, the scary thing is 90% of the world don't have it. So, like, I was trying to explain copyright in Sri Lanka, and they said, in Eastern Sri Lanka, and they said, what is copyright, right? Because I would say, these are going to be Creative Commons licensed buildings, and then the liabilities are this, and they said, I don't understand what you're talking about. We're just going to build this regardless. There's a lot of innovation going on in I'll say in higher education where I work, it's just not totally systemic. But when you talk about changing the paradigm of involving students in the work, build an exciting new building, and they go in and they have the same curriculum, you're going to destroy all the excitement of what they generated. So I'm curious to know what happens to these once the buildings are built or the students are involved, is it having a carry-through impact on the very concept that young people at any age can be involved in, their own, in defining their own educational experience? It's a very powerful metaphor for the whole educational system. Well, they're, they're rewriting the curriculum with the faculty, right? So part of that learning is there's a, there's a rewriting of how you, how you teach architecture. And I have to say, it's like, it's like learning to become a chef and never being able to make a cake, right? You know, it's like, well, now we've trained you. You've got to wait 10 years before you get to make that cake and taste it. The moment that you do a small structure, it's a simple structure with, you know, most of the United States, the, 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 the laws around the licensing for doing certain structures, like in, in Montana, you can do a huge structure without a license, basically because of the, uh, the lobbying of the ranching industry. Uh, versus in California. Believe me, I know there's 50 different rules in this, in this country. And uh, as a result, that most students can build a small building, right? The moment you've actually physically built something as an architect, it is like, I don't know, it's like it's the most addictive drug you've ever had in your life, right? So what happens is the actual physical building of something creates this like, our retention levels, I can tell you the, the letters that we get from former design fellows we get almost every couple of months where they're like, I want to come back. I want to do another building. I want to, and, and they're interested in different forms of architecture. They say, now I want to do something with straw bale. Or, you know, so they're redefining the way that they want. They're almost, um, rather than the one size fits all education for architect, like the cookie cutter, you're an architect, you're an architect, you're an architect. You know, it's a mass specialization through a customized curriculum. So you just have to have faculty that can handle that that you might have a student who's only focused on the relationship between public uh, space and skateboarding versus somebody who's interested in a gothic revival. You know, so I, I think it's the ability for mass specialization. So we're going to wrap up this session. But thanks to Carol and Cameron for sharing. <laughs>